Well, we are going to be looking at the Gospel of John, um, looking at, once again, at chapter 1, and we discussed, we've been discussing John the Baptist a little bit, and uh, he is a, really a remarkable man, and with a unique calling of God on his life. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'll read the... Um, I'll read the passages. There's actually two by way of review, of course, verses 6 to 8 and then verses 19 to 34. And um, we'll see, get some insights on the work that God did in and through this man. So, so chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, let's look at verses 6, 7, and 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So that's kind of our introduction to John. Then we go to verse 19. It says, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And for now, we'll stop there. So I wanted to, um, to bring out a couple of things about John, things that he says about himself that he is and that he is not, and things that he says about Jesus as he points to Jesus Christ. John's, it was a, uh, a ministry that was prophesied in the Old Testament. We'll look at that in a moment. But first, from verses 6, 7, and 8, John makes clear here, um, and this is John the Apostle writing and saying this, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So right away we learn something about John. We see that he is a man sent from God or sent by God, you know, for a particular ministry. And I commented on that once before about how exciting it is that God has actually, um, actually has his focus, his mind set upon us, and he sends the forerunner. He sends John. There's good news coming for God's people. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. We'll see later in chapter 3 where John talks, speaking of Jesus, where John the Baptist, speaking of Jesus, says he must increase, I must decrease. 
This verse 7 makes it clear that the ministry of John, and this is how he saw his ministry as well, that he came to simply bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. It, otherwise, John didn't see it as being all about him. He, um, John was one who was going to just simply, in faithfulness to God, bear witness to the one who was coming into the world. Then it says he was not the light. John, the apostle, writing in verse 8, he was not the light. He came to bear witness about the light. I can't help but to think in those, those couple of verses, especially 7 and 8, that we, we can keep that in mind about all ministry. Whatever God calls us to in ministry, it's never about us. It's always about what he's called us to do, and that's to point to Jesus Christ. I always question any minister or ministry that draws undue attention to itself. Um, talking about um, maybe exalting its experiences or um, I can rem think, remember ministries, I'm not going to mention names, but TV ministries where, boy, if you, uh, if you sent money to them and they would send you a, a prayer cloth because they prayed over it for you and there's a unique blessing on it and all that. There's just so much attention drawn to individuals exalting themselves. And that's never to be the ministry of any one of us. We are to always be pointing people to Jesus Christ. So he was sent from God. He came to bear witness about the light. And he himself was not that light. And he knew it, as we will see. And then in the next few verses, in starting with verse 19, that is, we're going to see three uh, points concerning who John the Baptist says he is not, and three identifiers as to who Jesus is, according to John the Baptist. So first of all, in the first several verses, starting with 19, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John had quite a significant following, okay? And um, messianic expectations were very high at this time. A lot of talk, kind of like it's been in, you know, I think of especially the 1980s, you saw a lot of that in our own time. And, and after, you know, is this, you know, a lot of talk and about the coming of the Lord, is this the generation and, and all the books and prophecy that were being written there, there began to be within the church this great expectation um, of the coming of the Lord. Then that kind of the message of many of the churches started dwindling down a little bit about the coming of the Lord, but there was some sense of expectation and a lot of weird stories, too, about a baby being born and immediately saying, Jesus is coming soon. And, you know, you see it's just kind of folk theology, of these kind of things, or the hitchhiker story, you know, that uh, somebody, you pick up a hitchhiker and he gets into your car and he says, I just want you to know Jesus is coming soon, then he disappears. I mean, there were so many stories like that around, you know. There's always the phony along with the, with the, with the truth, you know. And, um, but anyways... A lot of messianic expectation. And even though the Jewish people, the Jewish nation in general, was having this different concept of Messiah than, that Jesus, than Jesus would prove himself to be, I really believe God had his hands in that, in the expectation, stirring it up in people, because it made a huge, expecta um, I mean, a huge expectation of John and who this man must be. Because crowds and crowds were storming out to this man who's in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way for the Lord. So there is the ministry of John, but there's also something that God had been doing and stirring up the people's hearts with expectation that would contribute to them wanting to storm out into a wilderness to see this man. Of course, there was a the uniqueness of his ministry. The fact that he was, um, and this is an important point, if you remember, John, John's birth was predicted in Luke chapter 1, and um, 
And that's when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, the priest, when it was Zechariah's turn to go into the Holy of Holies and to offer the incense in the Holy of Holies, then come out again and bless the people. And so Zechariah was a pre from a priestly family, and so was Elizabeth. So what does that make John the Baptist? Somebody from a priestly family. He's, he's from that line, that priestly line, the Levitical line. So he's not, just, he's not just anybody in the minds of the Jewish people. He's somebody whose father was in the priesthood, and he's of the priestly line. And there he is out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way for the Lord. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Very strong message. So there was a great uniqueness to his ministry, plus he was doing something else that nobody else was doing. Um, bapt or actually others were doing it, but for a different purpose, that's baptizing. At the time, the Jews were baptizing, the Jewish leaders were baptizing proselytes, those who were coming to faith in the God of Israel and wanted to convert to Judaism. But that was just a baptism of cleansing for Gentiles who needed to be cleansed in order to associate with the Jewish people. So it was a rite of cleansing for Gentiles. But for this man, John the Baptist, to be in the wilderness calling Jewish people who already belonged to the covenant people of God, who without the men had already been circumcised, etc., had already participated in synagogue and temple, now he's, he's baptizing them. And the surprising thing is this. Many, many, many of these Jewish people were saying, yes, baptize me. They weren't resisting. And that, that really says a lot because the thought went through the, the minds of the leaders that becomes very apparent in Scripture and must have gone through the minds of many. Is like, well, I'm part of the people of God. I'm part of this church, this assembly of people, part of the synagogue. Why do I have to go through a ritual baptism that Gentiles go through? But they, the people by the, ma, by the massive numbers were submitting to John's baptism. That was really drawing an awful lot of attention throughout all of Judea and Jerusalem. And so the, it, it becomes a question, who is this the fear would be among the religious leaders the same as the fear they will have of Jesus. Is he going to cause disruption in our nation? What are the Romans going to do? Are they going to come and, and um, take our temple? Is this guy a uh, rabble rouser? Is he going to end up coming into Jerusalem uh, and cause riots and, and protest against the government or whatever? There were a lot of questions among the leadership in Israel. And as we saw, the Jews sent priests and Levites, first of all, go out and check this guy. He's one of you. He's a priest. Go out and check him out. Find out who this man is. And also, as we saw um, later in the chapter, the, um, uh, in verse 24, those who had been sent were sent by Pharisees. So this, you've got two different groups sending people to John. Who are you? Um, out of fear, out of curiosity. But for the leadership, it was mainly about, are you going to cause trouble? Are we going to have trouble with Rome? What, what kind of excitement are you going to cite in this, in this city that could get us in trouble? What kind of power and authority is going on here? So the leaders, that's their, that's their main contention here. What is going on? That's their question. And immediately, John says, I am not the Christ. So he disarms them in a sense by immediately saying, I am not the Messiah. Then they asked him, well, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. And um, the reason why they would ask him about being Elijah is from the prophecies in the book of Malachi. I'm going to read them to you real quickly. Malachi is the final prophet in the Old Testament. 
And in chapter 3 of Malachi, starting with verse 1, it says this. Um, before I read that, just one thing about it is that in the book of Malachi, you see the prophets, the prophets speaking for God, and then the people of God talking back at God. These are people who had been backsliding already. The, they had already been restored from Babylon to, to Israel. The temple had been built, but there's a hardening of their hearts, and they keep questioning God, questioning God, and the indications of backsliding. So Malachi here, when God is speaking through him, is going to be a bit sarcastic. Listen to this. First of all, God speaks, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So God is saying basically here, I'm coming. What chapter? Chapter 3 of Malachi, starting with verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Now, when we read words, it might be harder to understand the tone of voice, because we, we, we don't hear that. We don't hear the tone of voice or the emphasis that the prophet would have been putting on his voice what that would have meant to these people. But because of the context of this, because of the backslidden condition of the people, this is how it was coming across. And he says, the Lord whom you seek, okay, you, you say you're seeking the Lord, though you're not living for him. This Lord whom you claim you are seeking, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, Okay. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But watch verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? You want him? You want the messenger of the covenant to come? You want blessing? But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. He's coming to bring about righteousness. He's, and, and you see that in the ministry of John the, baptism, the, John the Baptist, excuse me, as he is telling people to repent, that the ax is already laid to the root of the tree. Okay, that, that, the, that the one, the coming one, the Christ is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and in fire. There will be a cleansing. And because the Lord's work is going to be one of cleansing of his people, that they would walk in righteousness, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old as in former years. You can only be pleasing to the Lord as you're walking in righteousness and in obedience before him. And then in chapter 4, the last two verses of the Old Testament. Starting with, excuse, verse, yeah, chapter 4, starting with verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Some translations will say I'll strike the earth with a curse. But the word curse there means to be handed over to destruction. So I'm sending one who will turn the hearts of the people. And that, of course, he mentions it's Elijah. So therefore, these religious leaders in John's gospel are wondering, are you that one? Are you that Elijah? Just think of how the, the, the massiveness of this man's ministry and the crowds that must be going out to him, that they would be concerned, are you the Messiah? 
Are, are, you, are you Elijah the prophet? There was something huge going on here. You know, it wasn't just a handful of people going out into the wilderness. And there, there were multitudes going out there, many probably just out of curiosity, but many that were genuinely repenting and submitting to the baptism. So what does John say when he says, are you Elijah? He says, I'm not. No, that's not who I am. We'll learn later that he's one who comes in the spirit of Elijah, but he's not Elijah, okay? Um, many believe, as, as I do, that Elijah is probably one of the two witnesses that we see in Revelation chapter 11, but that's a subject for a different day coming immediately before the second coming of Christ. So then they go on, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And I think we probably know what he means when he says, are you the prophet? And by way of review, I'll just read real quickly. You don't have to turn there if you don't want, but from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18 when God has, when Moses, God speaking through Moses, is warning the people of their penchant for false prophets, he says this, if you go to verse 15, he's saying, the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Moses is saying there's going to be a prophet like me. Well, what kind of a prophet was Moses? Moses was a leader. Moses is somebody who brought deliverance and salvation. And here's a big one. He is one who saw God face to face and communicated God's message from God to the people. Moses was a, a really significant prophet in the history of Israel, of the whole Old Testament. So God is, so Moses is saying, God, the Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. One who's going to have been with God face to face, who will come into the world with God's message. He will be a leader and a deliverer. In verse 16, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, like you, from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now remember when on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter and James and John saw Jesus transfigured, and then all of a sudden a cloud covered and a voice came out of heaven, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What does he say next? Listen to him. God, the witness comes right out of heaven. Listen to him. In John's gospel that we've been reading in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And the word was God. With, in relationship to, he's with God. And then verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The one who is in face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father from eternity comes into the world to make the Father known, to make the Father known. So are you that prophet, John? Are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And what does he say? He says, no. So they said to him, for heaven's sakes, <laughs> who are you? Who are you? See, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
I'll tell you what he didn't say about himself first. He didn't say, well, I'm kind of important. I'm of the tribe of Levi, descendant of Aaron, the priest. Um, my father was a faithful priest in Jerusalem, one who went into the tabernacle and offered um, the sacrifice of incense and came out and blessed the people. I have quite a heritage behind me. I'm a very self-sacrificial guy. I'm out here in the wilderness, and um, I have a pretty important calling in my life. After all, God told me to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. There's things that he could have said. He could have drawn attention to himself, but he doesn't in any way, shape, or form. You know what he says? I'm the voice. I'm a voice. You know, that's all I am, a voice. Man, that, that, is, that is incredible. All of his attention is faithfulness to the mission that God has given him to point to one person. That is Jesus Christ. That's, that's who I am. I am a voice. The voice of one in the wilderness crying out, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He points them to the scriptures. I'm, the vo I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. It's all about the Lord. You see what our lives are to be? Very much they should be like John, shouldn't they? We're not to draw attention to ourselves, but to always be pointing to Jesus Christ. We are a voice. We are a witness. Jesus did say to his disciples, you are, you are lights in the world. You are the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then he said to them, you are lights. But that's what they are. Lights that reflect the light of Christ, that point to Jesus Christ. This prophecy, and I'm going to close in a few minutes with this, but the prophecy that John's referring to is in the beginning of the consolation section of Isaiah the prophet. We all know about Isaiah and how hit the book of Isaiah is almost like a miniature Bible because the first 39 chapters are predominantly about judgment. But starting with chapter 40 and the remaining chapters, it's all about comfort and grace, restoration, deliverance, and salvation, where the Messiah himself is prophesied in, in Isaiah 53. And I realize that the chapters weren't really necessarily inspired by the Holy Spirit at all, but it is kind of interesting that there's 39 books in the Old Testament and there's 27 books in the New Testament. And Isaiah's kind of divided that way. The chapters 40 to 66, that's 27 chapters, are um, about consolation and comfort. But look at verse 3 of chapter 40 of Isaiah. A voice cries. See, John is identifying himself with that scripture from Isaiah, making it clear that there is a fulfillment of scripture. I believe he did it with the intent of pointing to these religious leaders. God is fulfilling prophecy. God is fulfilling prophecy. If anybody challenges you at all on the inspiration and the inerrancy of Scripture, you can tell them Scripture over and over and over again bears witness to itself. 700 years before John comes on the scene, it says, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John, who are you? I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. He's talking about here, really, metaphorically, the human heart, be, to be prepared. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Now, 
One thing I want to point out here, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The Lord there, if you notice in our Bibles, is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That, that's the name Yahweh. That's God's name. The glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yahweh, the Lord, has spoken. John will go on to say concerning the miracles of Jesus Christ, his signs, we have seen his glory. We have seen the glory of the Messiah. We have seen the glory of God in the miracles, the signs, the teaching of Jesus Christ. The one who was sent to the Jewish people was Yahweh himself. He's the Messiah, and that means everything. Verse, and then I close out with these verses. A voice cries. This is verse 6. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. There's so much there about what we can trust, but what I see here is the way the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to write this text. Immediately, immediately upon the prophecy of John the Baptist coming, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Immediately after that comes the reminder from God that all that people are is grass. This world that we live in, like the, we sang a song before, but it just all of this just kind of withers away. It, it goes, we're, we're like grass, and life, life goes by really fast. I think we're all discovering that life goes by fast. We're grass, we wither, then we're gone. Psalm 90, Moses brings out that same point. But the word of God abides forever. And we have seen the evidence of how the word of God comes to pass. John the Baptist came on the scene saying, I'm the voice. I am that voice that Isaiah prophesied. Otherwise, people of Israel, do not make the mistake of putting all of your trust in man and in the temporary glories of this world because they all wither and they will be gone. But God's God. word, his promise abides forever. God. And that's a message to each and every one of us. It's not about us. All the things that we treasure in this world, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the good things God has given us. But we must remember that we don't center our lives on the thrills and frills of this world, on fame and on this world's glory. Boy, the leadership in Israel made the big mistake of wanting to preserve the glory of the great temple and of their city, Jerusalem. Don't rattle the Romans. Instead, let's get rid of Jesus so that the Romans don't come and take away our place. Wow. But we have the promise right upon the heels of the coming of the voice in the wilderness, the word of God abides forever. 700 years later, there's John the Baptist saying, I'm the voice. God's promise, his covenant is being fulfilled. We need to put our trust in that. God's word abides forever. Remember the Jewish people went through 400 years of silence. They saw their temple destroyed, but God still raised up prophets and brought them back from Babylon and reestablished them in their own land. And then, I, then Malachi, the final prophet, prophesies and then for a little bit over 400 years, no prophets. 
total silence. That had to be a real challenge to many people in their faith. But then John comes on the scene and says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way for Yahweh himself, for he's coming. Praise God. God's word stands firm forever. No matter how many people will attack the word of God, how many, no matter how many people will attack the book of Genesis, the word of God is true and to be trusted, fully inspired, fully inspired, inerrant. We can trust the word of God. And we've heard the voice in the scriptures of one crying in the wilderness. And we saw, then he will, the next sermon, <laughs> we will see how he will point right to Jesus and say, behold, the Lamb of God. Can you imagine that? It's made clear that Yahweh himself comes, incarnate as a man into the world. And John the Baptist says, there's the lamb that's going to be slaughtered. What? <laughs> what? There's the lamb. Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll stop there. I just pray, Lord that this will impact our lives. That like John, we will see ourselves as instruments only. Yes, we are sons and daughters of God, much to rejoice and we have eternal life. But in ministry, in our purpose into this world, we are a voice, <gasps> people who point to the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, not our own message, not our own gospel, not our own ideas or our own philosophies, but we point to the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed on that cross to take away the sins of the world. That's the one we bear witness to. Oh God, our Father, impress that within our hearts. Mm. No matter what the culture throws against us, Lord, confirm your truth deep Within our hearts, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray now that the Lord would bless us and keep us, that the Lord would make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us, that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God. Let's stand.